Okay, so today we're going to start, um, we're going to keep up with reviewing a little bit here. We're going to review measurements just a little bit, first of all. So let's say we have something like 4 feet 5 inches plus 5 feet 3 inches. And if you recall from the beginning of last semester, when we add or subtract, we can only combine things that have the same name. That goes right down to the place value. When we're dealing with measurements like this, the place value is replaced by the units. So we can combine inches with inches and feet with feet. So we've got the columns already lined up. We start on the right and we work our way back to the left, just like we would with whole numbers. 5 plus 3 is 8 inches. 4 plus 5, 9 feet. Now, of course, it won't stay that easy. We might have 3 feet 8 inches plus 6 feet 7 inches. So we start on the right, we're coming back to the left again. 8 and 17 make, or 8 and 7 I should say make, 15 inches. Now that is greater than a foot. If we take out one foot, how many inches are left? 3 inches. So just like with any other addition, we're going to keep part of it and carry part of it. What part do we keep? The 3 inches, because this is the inches column, we keep the inches, we carry the foot. So 1 and 3 is 4, plus 6 is 10 feet. So 10 feet, 3 inches. How about something like this? Tell me where to start. ounces. 9 and 12 make 21 ounces. What to do with that? So 1 pound is 16 ounces. Good. What's left? 5 ounces. Okay. Keep the 5 ounces. Carry the 1 pound. 1 and 8 is 9 plus 3 is 12. And we might have something like this. Two plus three is five quarts. Of course, that is one gallon, one quart. Keep the quart, carry the gallon, and five gallons. Easy enough. When we subtract, things work the same way. We still can only combine things that have the same name. And we're still starting on the right, working our way back to the left. Here, however, 3 inches minus 9 inches can't be done, so we need to borrow, right? That's going to become 6 feet. This is going to become 15. Good. Biggest mistake people make on these is they just want to put a 1 in front of that 3. Remember, we borrowed a foot. That's 12 inches, so we have to add 12 to it. So now 15 minus 9 is 6 inches and 2 feet. 6 minus 4 is 2 feet.
Tell me what to do here. Borrow from the nine. That's eight. This is going to be 18. There are 16 ounces in a pound. So borrowing the pound adds 16 ounces to the two. And then? Eighteen minus fifteen is three. That's a pretty good distance. I don't know how that happens. Eight minus five. <laughs> <laughs> Eight pounds minus five pounds is three pounds. So now when we multiply measurements, we have like 3 feet 6 inches times 2 feet 3 inches. We generally won't leave it in that dual units. So in the metric system, we never use dual units like that. It's always either just meters and centi or centimeters, never the two of them mixed together like this. When we're multiplying, we could leave it like that. But remember, when we multiply, since we don't need the same name, every piece of one number multiplies every piece of the other. So we'd have to multiply here to get square inches, but we'd also have to multiply here to get inch feet, which is a unit, but we don't use it for anything anymore. So when we got all done, we'd have square feet, we'd have inch feet, we'd have square inches, and we'd have to combine them all together to make sense out of it. So... Rather than to do that, it makes more sense to either convert them all into inches or all into feet. So as inches, 3 feet 6 inches, how do I convert that all into inches? Well, it's 3 times 12 is 36, plus 6 is 42 inches. 2 feet 3 inches. 2 times 12 is 24, plus 2 is 27 inches. Very good. So 42 times 27 1134. And that is inches squared. If I were going to convert that all into feet, I would just put the inches over 12. That 3 and 6 twelves feet. Or to make it a decimal, 3.5 feet. 2 foot 3 is 2 and 3 twelfths feet. Or 2.25 feet. If I multiply that, 3.5 times 2.25, 7.875. And feet times feet is feet squared, or square feet. If I compare those two, a little bit more review here, what would the, should the conversion factor be between square inches and square feet? Don't say 12. 144, very good. 144 square inches in one square foot. So let's take this, and I'm going to go the other way, 7.875, if I multiply by 144, I better get my 1134, and I do. We've also looked at multiplying a scalar. So if we have a measurement, 3 feet, 8 inches, let's say I have a piece of wire or whatever that I need that's 3 feet, 8 inches, and I need 7 of them. I need to figure out how much total wire I need. So 7 times 8 is 56 inches. How many feet can I take out of that? Four feet would be 48 inches, so how many inches are left over? Eight inches. So I'm going to keep my eight inches, carry my four feet. Seven times three? 21 feet plus four is 25 feet. 25 feet, eight inches. <coughs> Division. We're going to look at first just a 
measurement divided by a scalar again. So we got something that's 27 feet, 4 inches long. We need to cut it into 8 equal pieces. How long will each be? Well, 8 goes into 24 how many times? 27. It's for 27, yeah. 3, which would be 24, right? So we're going to put 3 feet up there. 3 feet times 8 is 24. If we subtract, we're left with 3 feet. Before we bring down the 4 inches here, what do we have to do to the 3 feet? Convert it to inches. That becomes 36 inches. Now 4 plus 36 is 40 inches. So 40 divided by 8 is 5 inches. So if I had 27 feet 4 inches worth of material, and I'm cutting into 8 equal pieces. Each piece will be 8 feet, or 3 feet 5 inches. <coughs> now a lot of people prefer to turn that all into inches and then divide it by 8. The 27 feet 4 inches you have to take the 27 times 12. It's going to give you 324 plus 4 is 328. And you divide that by 8, it's going to give you 41 inches. Which then will convert back into 3 feet 5 inches. I prefer to do it this way because I can do the process fairly easy. And I don't have to work with really large numbers, like 324, 328. But I can understand working with the calculator, it might be easier to do it this way where you convert it all into inches. I'll leave that up to you. Now, what if I am dividing two measurements? What if I have something that is 32 feet long, and I need to divide it into things that are 4 feet long? Yeah, 32 divided by 4 is 8. What, my, what unit's going to go on there? Nothing. Feet divided by feet cancels out. Because if I'm taking 32 feet and I'm dividing it into four foot pieces, what I'm getting is the number of pieces, not a length anymore. We've also looked at, let's say we calculate a dimension and we, we find that a dimension on a part needs to be 2.438 inches long. We want it to, the nearest sixteenth of an inch. If you remember, what we do is we take our whole inches, we just drop them down. Two inches is going to be part of our answer. It's the decimal that we have to work with. 0.438. Notice the decimal point is still there. I haven't taken that out. I make it into a fraction by just putting it over one. Right now, though, it has a denominator of 1. I want it to have a denominator of 16. So I multiply by 16 on top and bottom. 0.438 times 16 is 7.008. So that's telling me it is between 7 sixteenths and 8 sixteenths. Which one's it closer to? Way closer to the 7. So that's 2 and 7 sixteenths inches. Does that look familiar? Okay. <coughs> so our next step is we're going to start talking about ratios. And ratios are just a comparison between two numbers. Like looking around the room, let's say we have... Students with hats, and students without hats. Right now, that is a 2 to 4 ratio. And I could write it like that as 2 over 4. I could write it like this with a colon, 2 to 4. Or even with the word 2 in it, 2 to 4. There are a lot of different ways to express a ratio. I like to use a fraction, like this fraction form, because there's a lot of things I can do with a ratio that are similar to what I do with a fraction. For example, I can divide both the top and bottom by 2 to simplify that to be a 1 to 2 ratio. Now I can do the same thing here. Oh, you're going to screw up my ratio now. I, put <laughs> um, I can take this one here and do the same thing, simplify it to 1 to 2. It's just I'm used to doing it as fractions. So I, I have that same appearance if I do it as a fraction. But all of these can be reduced to 1 to 2, and they mean the same thing. 
Now there are two types of ratios. Here I said one, two, two. And I'd pronounce that the same way all the way along here as I'm reading those off. But I might say the exact same ratio in a little bit different way. Two out of six have hats. So what I've done here is instead of comparing part A to part B, I'm comparing I mean, 2 over 6. I'm now comparing part A to the whole thing, the total. So that's why I have the terminology out of 6. There are a lot of cases where we have uh, things that only have two components in it. Like here, either you have a hat or you don't have a hat on. So you're in one group or the other. So let's see that I tell you that my next class coming in right after you guys leave is going to be a 4 to 7 ratio of hats to no hats. So it's 4 to 7. What would it be if I wrote it as out of? How do I know what the total is? Add them together. It would be 4 out of 11 wearing hats. So when we're dealing with ratios, that's often the case if there's only two components or two possibilities. We can convert back and forth between that comparison ratio, a two ratio, or an out of, a part to a whole ratio. So when you said four out of seven, you're really saying four over 11, not four out of 11. Yeah, this is four out of 11. This is a four to seven. When you write it as a fraction, it's hard to tell which one, which one it really is unless you know what they represent. When you write it out in words, it does, it's a little bit more clear. Um, like so for you guys, if you're mixing your uh, coolant, so you might have a, they call it a dilution. This is it the industrial term, technical term for it? Let's say you have a, a one in four dilution of concentrate and water for your coolant. In a dilution, the one in is the same as saying one out of four. That ratio of one to four, the one is representing your concentrated coolant. And the four is representing your total solution. So that's really one part coolant to three parts water. Does that make sense? Um, you might have ratios like, oh, through the tables here. These tables are 18 inches wide. Oh, let's do it the other way. They're six foot tables, so they're 72 inches long and 18 inches wide. So when I reduce that, the inches cancel out. Both of those divide by 18, giving me a four to one ratio. <coughs> um, One of the things with ratios is that it's a little bit different than fractions. If this was a fraction, I would just write that as a 4. With a ratio, I have to leave it as two numbers. A ratio is always a comparison of two numbers. So I will not reduce that down to just a whole number because I have to have that comparison. You'll notice, however, in all the ratios I've written so far, I compared students to students here. I compared inches to inches in fluid. The... The dilution, I may have been comparing ounces to ounces or cups to cups or whatever units. In a ratio, I compare two things with the same unit or the same label. So if I had something like 2 feet to 18 inches, that is not a ratio. Now I can convert that. I can make 2 feet into 24 inches, and now it is a ratio, 24 inches to 18 inches. And like any other fraction, I can reduce it and cancel out the inches. Both of those divide by 6 gives me a 4 to 3 ratio. Now here's another difference between our ratios and fractions. If that were a fraction, I'd make it 1 and 1 third as a mixed number. In ratios, we never turn them into mixed numbers. Because it's not 
a mixed number. It's a comparison between two numbers. It's not really a fraction. So our ratio is always compare two things with the same label, same units. So what if we don't have two things with the same units? So let's say we send Carter on a road trip. Let's say Carter goes 365 miles in seven hours. There is no way to convert miles into hours or hours into miles. So this is not a ratio. It is what we call a rate. So the first big difference between a rate and a ratio is a ratio compares two things with the same label. A rate compares two things with different labels. The second is up here for a ratio, it's okay to leave it as 4 to 3. Sometimes we'll put it into what's called the unit ratio, where we might make that a 1.33 to 1, or 1 and 1 third to 1. But when it comes to a rate, we almost always convert it into a unit rate. What a unit ratio or a unit rate means is we turn the denominator into a 1. So here the denominator is 7 hours. To make that a 1, we divide by 7 on top and bottom. So it's 1 hour on bottom. On top it is 52.1428571143. Approximately. And once we've reduced it to a unit rate, I'm going to round that to 52.14. A lot of times we change it so the appearance of the fraction is hidden in the units. So instead of having it written out as a big fraction like that, we just put the fraction in the unit, miles per hour, like that. In fact, a lot of times we'll hide it even further. Like let's say on this trip, Carter gets 26 MPG. What's MPG stand for? Miles per gallon. So the appearance of the fraction is taken out of this completely. But when we see 26 miles per gallon, what we need to think is this. 26 miles over one gallon. Because this is the form we need it in to do the calculations with and to work with. In fact, that can also become a conversion factor. Any ratio or rate can be thought of as an equivalency. 26 miles per gallon means 26 miles equals one gallon. So let's say Carter's total trip is 520 miles. And I want to know how many gallons of gas it took for the trip. Well, my conversion factor here, I'll put miles on bottom, gallons on top. 26 miles is one gallon. Miles cancel out. 520 gallons over 26. Divides out to be 20 gallons. He's not driving the bourbon, that's for sure. <coughs> so for rates, there's all sorts of rates out there. We saw the miles per gallon, uh, miles per hour. For you guys, you're going to deal with revolutions per minute. That's going to be a huge rate for you guys. Um, there's pounds per square foot for pressures, stuff like that. You guys will also be dealing with inches per revolution for your feed rates. Um, all sorts of rates that you're going to run into. One that's probably going to be the most important one for you guys as you get out of here dollars per hour, your wage is a rate. Ratios. Let's look at some common ratios here. Let's see how, how good you guys can have started to understand my artwork. Any guesses? No, it is not Carter. Gears, there we go. Gear ratios. 
Look at a gear ratio. In a gear ratio, is the number of teeth in the driven gear compared to the number of teeth in the driving gear. So, you don't want to do your people like that, bro. So for this one, how do we know which one's driven and which one's driving? We need a little bit more information here. So we'll continue with my amazing artwork here. Pretend that looks like a small electric motor. So now if I separate the gears, which one's going to stop? The little one. So that is driven. It is being forced to turn by the other gear. That has six teeth in it. So that goes on top. Driven goes on top. The other one has 14. And yes, we can reduce that to a 3 to 7 ratio. So that 3 to 7 is not only the ratio of teeth, it is also the ratio of RPM and the ratio of torque and stuff like that as well. Here, this one is going to end up with lower torque, higher speed, going from a large driving gear to a small driven gear. Let's go to something you'd be a little bit more comfortable with. Pulleys have no teeth. So for a pulley ratio, to measure the, the size, instead of counting teeth, we can just measure diameter. The reason we count teeth is for two gears to match, the distance between the teeth has to be exactly the same. So the ratio between the teeth and the gears will be exactly the same as the ratio in the, called the pitch diameters. The problem is, is where that pitch circle lies on the gear is unclear on the gear itself. So it's easier just to count the teeth. So here again, it's going to be driven over driving. So I'm going to put my little motor right here. So what's going to go on top in this ratio? If I cut the belt, which one stops? The 20. So that's the driven. The driving then goes on bottom, the 8 inches. Inches cancel out, both divide by four. That is a five to two pulley ratio. For pulleys and for years they are, yes. This one, however, is not pulleys or gears. This is. Anybody guess? Pistons. It's a compression ratio. Compression ratio is expanded volume. Over compressed volume. Your expanding volume is at bottom dead center. So it's at its largest volume above the top of the piston. Let's say that that is 480 cubic centimeters. Your compressed volume is at top dead center. When the piston's at the highest part of the stroke, as the lowest volume up here, let's say that is 60 cubic centimeters. This is literally 480 or 60. The cubic centimeters will cancel out. Both of those divide by 60, giving me an 8 to 1 compression ratio. You guys might have specific gravity. And specific gravity is the ratio of the mass of an object to the mass of the equal amount of water. Oh, no. Oops, sure. Specific gravity is, as I said, technically specific gravity is the ratio of the mass of an object to the mass of an equal volume of water. So if you put the, the, the 
measure the mass of the object, then you put the object into a full container of water and measure how much water runs over the edge. Measure the mass of that water. That's what specific gravity is. But it's easier to just say density of an object to the density of water. And if you get into the material selection, material engineering side of things a little bit more, um, I guess showed you guys that example when we did systems of equations with the, uh, the phase diagrams, the binary phase diagrams. And we used the copper nickel one because it's one of the more simple ones to look at where we were able to figure out, okay, at this temperature, how much solid copper and nickel do we have? How much liquid copper and nickel do we have? Um, specific gravity goes along with that type of, of situation where you can figure out the properties of the material based off of the sp specific gravity is one of those properties that we deal with. Okay. One last example I'll show you then I'll give you guys some homework here. In the construction field, two terms, slope and pitch. A lot of people think they mean the same thing. And a lot of people use them to mean the same thing. However, they do not mean the same thing. Slope, just like it is with equations, is rise over run. So let's say I have a truss here that spans 24 feet and is 6 feet tall. What is the rise of that? Six feet. What's the run? The run is going to be half of the span if it peaks in the middle. The run is 12 feet. So this is what we would call a 612 slope. When we talk about slope, we always list it as out of 12 inches. So it's 6 inches of rise per 12 inches of run. It's run rise per foot. Pitch is height over span. So for the same situation here, 24 foot span, 6 feet of height. We still have six feet of height, but our span is 24 feet. That reduces to a one-fourth pitch. The difference is, back in the day when they built a house, they didn't have these prefab trusses. How did they build the roof? They put a beam up on top and they ran rafters, right? So slope, or sorry, pitch, is based off of that concept. If you're going to set a ridge beam and then build rafters on top of it, the pitch tells you how high to set that ridge beam above the top of the wall. A one-fourth pitch means you take one-fourth of the span and that's how high the ridge beam goes up above the wall. So one-fourth of 24 is six feet. The, the ridge beam is six feet above the wall. Slope is when you do the prefab trusses. That 612 slope defines all the angles that you have to cut all these pieces down here on bottom and stuff like that. <coughs> so they just have different applications as well. Okay, so I'm going to give you two packets to work on. In the first packet, I want you to do the first page, which is 1 through 30. All of them. Not just the odds. And the second packet, which is going to be math for machine tool, I'm going to have you do page 227, 1 through 16. So I'll get those packets to you right now.